Welcome to Interviews from Mexico. I'm Laura Carlson, and I'll be your host as we look at cutting-edge issues with the men and women who know them best, here on Telesur. The new phase of colonization is marked by dispossession, and the state and the private sector have set up their own set of laws and policies to carry it out. That's the bold premise of the latest book of our guest today, Francisco Lopez Barcenas. Francisco is a Mistec lawyer and researcher who's written numerous books and articles on indigenous rights, cultures, and the threats they face. Francisco, thanks so much for being with us here today on Interviews from Mexico. Thank you very much. Francisco, in this latest book, you talk about this new phase of colonization. How would you describe it? I think, as some writers have uh, argued, as indigenous peoples in Mexico, and I think in Latin America in general, we passed through four stages of colonization. The first stage is what history has called colonization properly, starting with the Portuguese and Spanish invasions and lasting until the wars of independence, which resulted in the first national states being established. Then there's a stage where the Creole and Mestizo liberals impose themselves as the ruling class, which is the second stage. It was very, very brutal, this second stage. Some even say that it was more intense than the Spanish colonization because the existence of people's of the people was denied and there was an assault against the collective life of the uh, indigenous people and against their territories. The third stage that I talk about is what in Mexico is called the revolutionary state, which generated a politics of indigenism. In that stage, well, one of the promoters of indigenism, Gonzalo Aguirre Beltran, stated it very clearly. Indigenism is a policy of the non-indigenous directed at the indigenous so that they will cease to be indigenous. And it has had a lot of versions like integrationism, for example, but the issue is that they wanted the people to disappear culturally. And that included their, con their cosmovision, their forms of organization, their forms of seeing nature, and their relationship with, to society. Uh, but this stage, this period that I talk about in the book, is very specific because it owes a lot to the previous stages, but is marked by the model of a capitalism that was being develop, developed in Mexico, and I suspect across uh, Latin America. And that model, as you mentioned, it is a uh, kind of capitalism that tries to strip the, the indigenous people of their common resources, turn them into commodities and bring them into the market. Well, it's interesting, this analysis that you do, the historical analysis, because most people only think of colonialism as being that first stage, the conquest and the, the Spaniards arriving in the New World. And then, and they very rarely think of the revolution as being a stage of colonialism. In this latest stage that you talk about, what are the kinds of resources that are particularly coveted and that are at the center of this dispossession? Yes, well, there are resources that ca the capital needs to reproduce itself. In other words, many of the resources that today are privately owned, for a long time there were common goods, and in Mexico there were the property of the nation. In fact, there is still property of the nation according to the Constitution, even though new laws treat them as private property. Minerals, for example, Minerals are very important right now because of the technological revolution going on in the world and we're talking about 
Minerals, not just the traditional ores, as there's something sometimes called, like iron, used for building railroads or uh, with the technology of the revolution period for building their big avenues. That still exists, but there are other resources that have become very important because of the technological revolution. Lithium, for example, indium, uh, with their rare air elements for example which are needed to make cell phones and computers but mostly they are needed for the weapons industry we're not just talking about jewelry anymore like silver and gold either no, no, although those minerals are still important. Now, in Mexico, we still haven't started the second stage. We're still basically in the first stage. But that's a very important aspect. In fact, there are official figures that say that 30% of the national territory has been conceded to foreign mining companies, especially from Canada, the United States, China, and also some Mexican companies that are quite strong in that sector. But other kinds of resources, water, water is becoming very important and it's closely related to mining because of the extractive model that is used. But there's also an issue around the building of the dams and also uh, waters needed to feed the new industries that are growing, like the automotive industry and agriculture for export, especially to the United States. That uh, also has a big effect on the use of water and uh, biodiversity. We are entering a stage of a capitalist development where biodiversity and the knowledge of rural campesino and indigenous communities about these resources is becoming very valuable. Just a few months ago, I was reported that a Japanese university made a new chayote by crossing to Mexican varieties. And the, this university in Japan Get these varieties of chayote were from with the help of the Mexican government, the Ministry of Agriculture and Agencies in the Health Department, and the support of the of indigenous people, like uh, the National Commission for Indigenous Development. And that's where knowledge becomes property because we have intellectual property laws that, that permit foreigners to patent this kind of thing, right? So it's become another kind of, another area in which transnational corporations have become interested. We never think of knowledge as property in that sense usually either. Yeah, well, we have Mexican law, but above Mexican law is international law, and a lot comes from the World Trade Organization, the WTO, and the World Bank. They passed a lot of international legislation with uh, which nations end up adopting and incorporating into national legislation. And these ideas start to permeate and uh, modify the objectives of the legislation because the national laws we have on intellectual property in principle they are laws that protect individual rights. In that sense, it's about protection of individual rights. But the international law, and there are a lot of them on collective knowledge, and they're not about protection, but about opening up paths for business to come in and take that knowledge for themselves. The title of the book is The Land is Not for Sale lands and territories of indigenous peoples in Mexico. The land is not for sale has become a slogan of indigenous movements in the entire world. And of course we know that the land is for sale, that it's bought and sold all the time. Yet it has a deeper meaning. We're talking here about basically two models, two ways of seeing the land itself. Could you explain that for us? See. Sí. 
Yeah, well, first of all, I should say that the title of the book is half a slogan. The land is not for sale, it should be loved and defended. That's the complete slogan. And yeah, absolutely, it has the intention of putting forward the vision about land. The vision is to see land as a territory, to see it as a totality with the natural resources and also with uh, its uh, symbolic components, the cultural and religious aspects, the mythical aspects about the origins of people, that is territory. So, that goes against the commercial conception of land that the companies have, that land is a product that can be turned into a commodity, and that it can be, well, whoever wants it can have it, whoever can pay for it, or like the CEO of Nestlé said, the best way of protecting water is turning it into merchandise, because then we will all know that it has an economic value, and we will take care of it. And and I think that what we have here is a dispute about territories between two very contradictory positions, and I think that the peoples are very invested in this idea of defending Lao land as a common good, which in the end is a common good that allows everyone to have a dignified life, right? It has a lot to do with values then. I mean, the quote from the director of Nestlé saying, the only way we're going to value water is by giving it an economic, an economic price, basically, is, is a way of saying that that's the only language we understand anymore. You touched on the second question that has to do with the title, which is uh, the lands and territories of indigenous peoples. And that is the distinction between lands and territories, because it's something that a lot of people aren't familiar with. What is that distinction? Yes, I, uh, look, I think that obviously there is a profound distinction, although we have to say that uh, peasant farmers in general didn't make this distinction because for them land in itself is territory in their conception because of their values, as you said. But from an outside perspective, land, at least uh, as it is seen in the regulations in Latin America and Mexico, is the land, is the surface that is uh, allotted as a property in some way. In Mexico, we have uh, at least four types of property. We have private property, we have ejido property, we have communal agrarian property, and we have public property. So this shows how property in Mexico was deeply affected by the pre-Hispanic ideas that, uh, that existed before the Spanish arrived, but also about the vision that the Spanish brought when they came here. It's not the Romano-Germanic vision that we learned in school that it was a unified property, that's the third part. But territory is much more than communal property, and much more than ejidal property, because what it refers to doesn't just encompass the surface area. In fact, according to International Law Convention 169 of the International Labor Organization, as I explained on the book, the, the territory, the entire habitat that is used or utilized in some way. It's a very wide definition, but it has to do with the fact that we're not just talking about the terrestrial space, but also the air and under the ground. The territory that an indigenous people use, or can it be another group as well? In principle, I'm talking about indigenous territory, although some other communities, Afro-Mexican or Afro-descendant, as they are known, also have this vision. And I have found that in some parts of Europe, the, I don't know if they still have it, but at one point they had this idea of territory as terrestrial air and underground space. But why? Because life, the life of human beings, the life of people has to do with both concepts. In Mexico, 
For instance, I talked to a campesino woman, a masegual, from Puebla, and she explained to me that when someone gets scared, when then they do a ritual, and or when they lose their soul, as we will say, they say that 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 the soul goes to the underground, the tlaloca, and that somebody has to go down to get their soul and bring it back, to bring the person back to life. In that place, not just any place. Not in just any place, and not just any person, someone who knows how to travel from one spatial dimension to another, so to say. So we're talking about the importance of these, the cultural importance of these spaces. That's why I think it's important, relevant, that even to campesinos and the indigenous peoples don't make that decision, because for them there is no difference when we're talking about international law and when we're not among their, their indigenous people, it is important to take this in account. Because something could happen, like, for example, a mining company comes in and starts excavating in a place that is sacred for an indigenous people. And obviously they are going to defend their land, and this has happened in many cases. They kick them out. For the mining company, this the business, this place might not serve any purpose other than an economic one. But for for the indigenous people, it's a question of survival. So that difference in, in models, in visions of the land is, is what's causing a lot of the conflicts that we're seeing. You mentioned in the book that this privatizing, this recent privatizing wave began with the reforms in 1992, and it's been relentless since then with the changes in laws the, uh, and the corporations that have been coming into the country to exploit these natural resources. How then do you explain the fact that so much of Mexican natural, national territory continues to be in the hands of ejidos, social farms, or indigenous communal lands still? I think that it has to do with the cultural relationship that exists between the people and the spaces, because the people and the land, or in the words of international law, between the people and the territory. I hope that makes sense. But look, I am new savvy. I'm mixed tech. As other people call us, for us, the central thing is the new, the people. But new also means land, space. Same word. But the same word is also used to mean sacred. So new is land, new is space, and new is sacred. Sacred land. Right? So, no one can go, well, now, with the influence clearly from outside. A lot of people sell it with migration, a lot of people leave their land. But in principle, there is a spiritual relationship between the land and the people. How is that manifest? Well, first of all, we think of time differently. Also, we ask for permission from the land if for blowing before it will hurt the land. We thank the land uh, when we harvest because there's, it's feeding us. We ask permission from the water before taking it from the spring and running it into a canal so we can use it. We ask permission of a tree. We ask permission of an animal or, or of those who, according to mythology, take care of the animals. So these kind of relationships, which I think are the deep cultural root of the relationship between people and nature, are the reason that so many people, even though they are under pressure to sell, don't sell. Because they also know that if they sell their land, if they give it up, their existence is at risk. Yeah, I remember when the free trade agreement started, there were a lot of people who said, well, of course, all these three million corn farmers, many in indigenous communities in remote areas of the country, are going to become workers because it just makes more sense in the rational, in the rational scheme of Western economics. And yet a lot of them held out.
and they stayed on their land, and it's when people began to realize the strength of what you're talking about. Francisco, this concept of territory that takes into account the social and the cultural and even the spiritual relationship of people to the space that they grow up in, that they're, that they're rooted in, is actually represented in, in modern law. What's the role of international law in all this? Well, I think that a positive aspect of globalization has been that it globalizes everything. It doesn't just globalize capital, it has also globalized rights and law through international bodies like the United Nations or other organizations like the International Labor Organization or UNESCO. And in general, they have have also generated binding international norms for states. And in that sense, for indigenous people, especially the International Labor Organizations Convention 169, which was signed in 1989, ratified in 1991, and it was ratified in 1990 and went into effect in, in 1991. Since then, it's been in effect in Mexico and well, that convention is very important, not just for indigenous people because for the first time in the world, collective rights were included for the first time and the collective rights are the rights of people, right? That's very interesting. But since then, an international legal doctrine has developed that these peoples are right holders. But what are those rights? Autonomy, self-determination, territory, self-government, the right to culture, the right to language. These are rights that we haven't seen recognized before. We've seen them maybe in the figure of the rights of my minorities, like in 1960, but as rights of persons who form part of those minorities, now we're not talking about the rights of individuals who make up the, the, the people, but about the rights of the indigenous people themselves. So in their international law, the peoples have become subjects of, of rights. That's a fundamental change. In many cases, the states uh, thought they compromised, they, they committed to respect. They haven't understood it, and they haven't wanted to understand it. And that's why the struggle of the people still has a long way to go. In many cases, it's a struggle for recognition. In others, a struggle to be able to fully exercise. In your book, you go through the different kinds of laws that apply directly to indigenous rights, and especially the right to defend lands and territories from the kind of looting and dispossession that we're seeing in this phase of colonization. The law can be an instrument in these fights, you say, and yet it's not the only factor. What else is important? What's the motivating or the most important factor in the defense of land for indigenous peoples today? Well, I'm convinced that it's uh, organization by the people. Actually, it's true. In the book, I argue that law is a tool, but unlike other writers, I don't say that law is a tool that is in the hands of the bourgeois. Rather, it's a tool that can be used by whomever can take control of it, whomever knows how to use it. And from there, I present the book as, well, primarily it's directed at indigenous and campesino communities. Then it's directed at whoever can take advantage of these tools. I understand that businesses already have their offices. I'm not worried about the businesses understanding the law. They already understand it. I'm interested in, in making sure that indigenous people know that they can use this for, so they don't think that they cannot solve all of their problems with the law. And it turns out that's not true. They should understand that how far it can go 
and what extent is necessary to combine with other struggles, which many peoples are participating in now. Yeah, Francisco, you talk a lot about both the possibilities and the limitations of law and the legal system. And there does sometimes seem to be kind of a contradiction because we started out with this very bold statement that the corporations and the state have really constructed a set of laws that operate to provide a framework for this process of dispossession. So how do indigenous peoples use the laws? Do they have find the laws that are favorable to them? Do they have to figure out you know, what works and what doesn't? It seems like it's kind of a, a tricky field in which to operate for the defense of rights if the laws themselves were made in many cases to favor the corporations. Yeah, it's very difficult, effectively. The laws are written to allow companies to take their resources, that's clear. But it's not just that. The state itself is designed to facilitate the dispossession. And there are policies that reinforce that situation too. So, today, there is an unequal struggle. However, there is one thing that I think gives a lot of power and legitimacy to rural campesino societies and the indigenous peoples. The capitalist system can't go much further. I'm not saying it will end tomorrow, but what it has shown is that the last few decades is that it will go through crisis after crisis after crisis, and there is no solution anymore because uh, it has reached a level where producing more generates uh, creates a problem to who will buy, and suspending production creates the problem that the system loses its justification for existing. And with low salaries for workers, which is also part of their formula, they have fewer consumers for what they're producing, and then we have an environmental crisis looming as well. Totalmente. Totally. And so, what I want to say is that the people have historic reasons on their side, and they also have the logic of the future in their side. Look, in 1804, France enacted the civil code, which will later be the model for the whole world, as at least uh, all of the world governed by Germanic law. In that discussion, the French bourgeois of the 19th century said, there are goods that can't be made part of this market because the world run the risk of destroying life itself. And what are those goods? And you can still read it in the codes. There are goods that, because they are part of nature, cannot be made part of the market. And there are goods that, under the law, are not part of the market. Goods that are part of nature at that time refer to air. Now we can see that's no longer the case. Look at the wind farm, right? And law stipulated that water, among other things, could not be bought and sold on the market because it will put the existence of life at risk. That's what the French bourgeois, bourgeois said. Now the bourgeois that we have today is breathing the nonsensical idea that these things can be commodities. That amounts to being a game against the future of life, not just human life, but life in general. So when the indigenous people defend water, when they defend the environment, when they defend nature, what they are questioning is this entire model. And what they are saying is that there are other ways. Francisco, that's a powerful argument. The future is on our side because what we're seeing now is just unsustainable. And I think we have a lot of evidence by, of that by now. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, thanks very much to all of you, especially to you, Laura. Thank you for, for this space. Francisco Lopez Barcenas, New Savvy lawyer and writer, and the author of this recent book, La Tierra No Se Vende, The Land Is Not For Sale, Lands and Territories of Indigenous Peoples. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back next week on Interviews from Mexico. Mm -hmm.